Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, a creative content writer here in Chesterfield. I'm very happy to tell you that Chesterfield Behind the Mic is back on the air once again. Uh, greetings and salutations from the year 2022. Uh, obviously, this is our first show of the new year. And, and I, what a better topic um, to, to, ta- to start with, right? A look back at sort of where things were in 2021 and a look ahead to 2022. And I'm very, very glad to be joined by uh, Dr. Joe Casey, our county administrator here in Chesterfield. Dr. Casey, how are you? Great to see you, Brad, and thank you and your crew for being here on a snow day. <laughs> well, you know, the, the donuts have to get made no matter what, right? Um, first off, how was your holiday? How, how was the end of 2021 for you? Uh, it was uh, very memorable. I was able to uh, see all three of my children and my mother, who, yeah. who I wasn't able to see uh, in 2020. So mm-hmm. I count that as a blessing. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, as we saw each other, we, we all were taking different tests at different times, <laughs> and it wasn't anything involving math or English. There you go. <laughs> the, the, the sign of the times, even uh, as we go into 2022, obviously. Um, we're going to talk a lot today about the state of the county, and um, you just got done. I guess it, I say just, but that was several weeks ago now. Um, for folks who have not had a chance to see it, um, your state of the county address to the chamber is on our YouTube channel. You can check out it uh, in its entirety. Um, there's a whole lot of information that we're going to focus on from that in today's conversation. But for folks who want to see the whole thing um, and the original recipe, so to speak, feel free to, to check that out as well. I kind of want to start with a, a general sort of question about the strength of the economy. Um, you know, it felt like as you were talking about some of the, um, the, the things we saw, not just, I guess, in 2021, but really over the last 20-ish months, the growth um, that we've seen in Chesterfield. And I think for a lot of people, when you start talking about the state of something, especially for an entity like the county, like Chesterfield, um, it, you know, it's it's so much about, you know, what what's the brass tax, right? And certainly the, to, to see the sort of growth we saw over these last, you know, roughly two years, right? So normally, you, I think you said it was 3.8-ish percent year over year growth. And over these, that period of time, it's more like seven for us. What What would you attribute that growth to Um, Because you mentioned, you know, for a lot of people that they were worried about maybe there was a recession coming and that just wasn't our experience during the pandemic. What what would you attribute that growth to that we've seen here in Chesterfield? I I think there's many factors, Brad. And and again, I'm a CPA by trade and and been in local government for 30 years, mostly on the finance side. And and I've never seen what we have faced over the last two Mm. years. And, And again, as you mentioned, when the onset of the pandemic started, we were prepared for a long drawn out recession equal to if not longer Mm -hmm. than the pandemic. And and I think what it came to being is the resiliency of citizens, businesses, and others to figure out how to pivot. And again, so that's a word that was used probably in 2020, Mm -hmm. almost uh, ad nauseum, but but pivoting to figuring out how to survive, how to thrive, how to be productive, how to change your goods and services in the mm-hmm. ways that they could get to a customer mm-hmm. uh, and get to uh, each other. And and our citizens themselves and the businesses that they work for rose up. So mm-hmm. what became a teleworking environment for many companies, mm-hmm. we benefited uh, inordinately because we had about 110,000 workers every day waking up and driving out of Chesterfield County right. to work. Right. Now, having said that, we had 80,000 people coming in. The jobs that were in Chesterfield, again, are traditionally the goods and services that need to be site-centric. Right. Uh, or, or we make many products and goods or distribute many products. Mm-hmm. So those were on-site type jobs. Right. But again, many of the teleworking jobs in Central Virginia, the homes of those employees mm-hmm. were Chesterfield County. Mm-hmm. So when they are teleworking, they are spending their time morning, noon, and night, mm-hmm. in essence, in their neighborhood, in their community consuming the goods and services that they otherwise may consume as they travel. Right, right. And then, you know, in terms of, you know, growth, you can't, you kind of can't be steady without some sort of, you know, especially for an entity like, you know, the county, fiscal responsibility is very important. And it's not just a matter of making sure that the right decisions are made at the the front end of the pandemic. But then, you know, you look at, I think the number you quoted was $249.6 million in federal money um, coming into the county for a variety of different uh, topics, 61 and a half million for CARES, two million and change in other CARES relief, 20, almost 22 million in rent and mortgage relief, 68 and a half for coronavirus, where that's state and local, another 80 million in school relief. I mean, there's a lot of different things that money is coming into the county, but this is not necessarily money that's always going to be there. And so as, a, as the entity, you know, as the locality has to make, you know, sound fiscal decisions, what went into some of the, the ways that the county decided to use those funds? And, and what was sort of the, 
the methodology as you went through that process and, and continue to? Sure. Well, it's it's multifold. You know, first and foremost, I, I do credit the federal government for the first time in my history, mm-hmm. uh, giving the flexibility and the freedoms, still many rules and regulations, <laughs> hundreds of pages right. uh, that, that kept on changing through Treasury regulations. Right. But having said that, it enabled us to figure out what is best for the people of Chesterfield County. So we were able to invest federal dollars into creating assets mm-hmm. and infrastructure that we otherwise were not going to necessarily get to for years Mm -hmm. uh, or would have to debt finance ourselves and burden the people with a debt service payment. Mm -hmm. We were able to help out those in the most needs, Mm -hmm. you know, rent relief, food services and things of that nature, partner with their schools and trying to help Mm -hmm. school children learn as best they can in remote environments or safe environments. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, it's trying to keep a safe workplace for our workers Mm -hmm. and trying to have the business partnerships for the grants that were permissible to them. Mm -hmm. Now, the the federal government's grants to the businesses maybe were not as much as I thought they could be, but again, they were intentional. And that was one of the things too, as we as we look ahead to, you know, coming out of 21, we know there's probably looking like maybe a bond referendum this this year. Um, in terms of uh, bond rating, right, uh, you, you talked in your state of the county about ESG. And I really want to get into the difference between that and AAA. I think for a lot of people, AAA is just the thing we we know, right? It's the, it's the rating that everybody's aware of. But ESG is a, is a new, fairly new um, new one. And I'm just curious how those two compare and, and what are some of the takeaways for folks as to sort of where Chesterfield is on, on that spectrum? Well, Chesterfield County's had the triple, triple A bond rating. And for those that don't know, that's three different rating agencies of Wall Street. Mm-hmm. And, and they are a, the respected entities. And the bond rating itself is just how good of an investment is mm-hmm. it for the debt holder or the right. bond holder right. in Chesterfield? Are we going to make our bond payments? Right. And triple, triple A means it's 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 a no brainer. Right. Um, and when we first got that, maybe two to three decades ago, we were in an elite field of just mm-hmm. very few uh, mm-hmm. counties uh, across the country. Mm-hmm. I think even after 20 to 30 years, there's only maybe 40 to 50 counties mm. across the entire county country mm. that have that coveted rating. Mm-hmm. We've had it so long, I even joke with some of the rating analysts, I was like, you need a triple A plus or a quadruple <laughs> A because we, we, we just, we're off the charts right. as far as their rating criteria. Right. So that's why I welcomed when yeah. they came up with the ESG, which stands for environmental, social, and governance. And each one of them has like four or five different traits below them. Mm-hmm. They, they are peripheral in essence to what is our ability to make a debt payment. Right. That's still going to be the bond rating. Mm-hmm. Environmental, social, and governance is, is the whole package deal, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, is this, is this a place where people want to settle and live right. and know right. that there's a quality of life factor where a business wants to expand or move to? Right. Are we, are we, mindful of the environment? Are we mindful of people's needs? Right. Do we have a diversity factor and an awareness of it, inclusivity, right. that, that are all important traits as far as a quality of life? Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, not to our surprise, but again, when, when these rating agencies first come out with these criteria, they usually mm-hmm. make them so high that they're right. idealistic. Right. So for us to get the highest rating right. out of the gate right. uh, makes it special. And, and again, we have to research more to see where others are and where others fall. But it's a byproduct of who we were. We didn't see the rating criteria and say, here's who we want to be. We were there already. Right. Uh, when we're talking about fiscal responsibility, I want to talk a little bit about tax rates. Um, obviously, because of the the health of the economy and because of sort of the, the reality on the ground, um, you know, we, we understand the, the real estate market. We understand that there's a lot that goes into that. And certainly as a county, you want to be mindful of, of the balance, I guess, between those two things. Now, one of the things you talked about was in your state of the county was being proactive, right? Lowering that starting point, so to speak. So it, it has been now advertised for 93 cents, which would come down from 95. And there's a lot of other relief of tax relief that, that goes into the, to the, to the big picture for residents. But I just want to focus on the tax rate and why, why was now the right time to look at that and make those changes um, and to go lower? I mean, I guess technically speaking, it could go, you know, depending on how the supervisors decide to, to, to vote on it, it could go lower than 93. 93 is just advertised as the maximum. But I'm just curious, well, why was now the right time for that change? Well, we addressed this issue a couple of years ago when we had inordinate um, property value growth mm-hmm. and, and inordinate in a good way. I mean, again, I view people's property, citizens' houses as their investment. Right. For many people, you know, it's their nest egg. So mm-hmm. when they go to sell it later in life, they want to sell it for more than they bought it right. and, and, and net the difference and, and net whatever additional equity they have in it. So uh, I give the people at Chesterfield credit. For the most part, they understand it's an investment. Mm-hmm. Now, having say that, saying that, you know, we do tax that investment. Right. And I have to be mindful and respectful of that. 
Uh, for some reason, you know, there's there's three primary sources that government gets its monies. Mm -hmm. It's the income tax, which is primarily federal and, and state. Mm -hmm. It's the sales tax, which is state, and property tax, which is local. As people buy more goods and services, you don't hear discussions about, wow, we had a really good sales tax year. Let's lower the sales tax rate. Or when people's incomes are going up, people's you know, the federal mm -hmm. government says, hey, this is a good time to lower the tax rate because people earn more money. Right. Uh, you know, the laws are written so that the property taxes is, is the focal point right. of, of everybody's uh, of everybody's tax bill. Right. In fact, the advertisements under state law for any change in a tax rate uh, are of the font size of the Hindenburg crashing, <laughs> I think. So, you know, having said that, that, that's the environment I've grown up in. Right. And what we try to do is educate people. It's a tax rate times their value equals the bill. Mm -hmm. We're sensitive that it's the bill that you pay, right. not the tax rate. Right. So if the value is going up and we don't adjust the rate, mm -hmm. then, then again, your bill is higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if the value of your home is going up by an inflationary factor, greater than what our need is for our own inflation mm -hmm. or our needs and initiatives. Sometimes it's the mandates of the federal and state government right. that we have to fund without mm -hmm. any monies. Yeah. So we, we have to figure all of that out. Unfortunately, all 135,000 houses plus in Chesterfield County don't grow at the same amount. At the same rate, So right. some may have a higher tax bill even when we lower the rate. Some may have a, a flat tax bill. Some places actually have lower tax bills. Mm -hmm. uh, that's state law. I have to give one rate to all people and I have to assess everybody under the same methodologies. Right. And and I feel like, for, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, your career in this. Uh, I would imagine there have been, you know, obviously a, a number of times where you've seen the real estate market sort of, you know, boom. Um, I'm not sure where this one ranks in that, but it certainly feels like this one is the more um, significant and maybe the sharper increase than, than others. And I'm just curious how much of a, um, a factor that played in the decision-making process, not just that assessments were going to go up, but the expectation that they're going to go up at a significant level. And, you know, that, you know, that balance that fiscal responsibility. I'm just curious how, how what, what role did that play in that decision? Well, we, we look at a lot of factors. We talked to the Home Builders Association and again, the values of their properties and what they're constructing for which the sale may be a year plus from now seem mm -hmm. to be very strong. Right. We look at most recent apartment sales. You know, mm -hmm. we just had a 700 unit apartment complex that's probably one of our lowest rental units mm -hmm. as far as uh, rent uh, sold for about uh, an average of 150,000 per unit mm -hmm. for each of the uh, for over 106 million dollars mm -hmm. I mean it, those are those are factors that are just showing the strength of it having said that we are also paying close attention to you know are people overextending in, in mortgages right, right. or debt mm -hmm. and I, I will say uh, from the last great recession of 2008 or so the banks have gotten much more judicious, mm -hmm. partially regulatory, mm -hmm. and not having uh, incomes be you know too high of a component of a, of a mortgage payment. Right. Uh, we are trying to pay more attention to the rental markets because mm -hmm. the, the regulations aren't there. And, and if there are households that are paying more than 50% uh, of their paycheck towards rent, mm -hmm. uh, there's an at-risk factor that we have to be careful too. So we take it very seriously. When we start the process to lower rate, we feel very comfortable with it. As we've said before, it doesn't mean that's, that's the high point of it. If we get comfortable and see other variables going forward mm -hmm. uh, with, with further growth above what we need, then we will continue to right. reduce the rate. Now, um, you know, we'll see what the, the Board of Advisors does with the tax rate and where that settles here in the near future. Um, certainly that's a, a part of, you know, kind of pushing forward, right? And as you called it in your state of the county, you know, not resting on your laurels. What's ahead? You know, what's, what, what are we going to do as we go into the future and, and into 2022? Uh, we mentioned the, the bond referendum. Uh, I think part of what I want to look at, aside from, you know, just sort of where, the, um, where things are on the fiscal side, is like it seems like people are pretty happy. Um, relatively speaking, our customer satisfaction survey came in, something you mentioned uh, in, in your state of the county, um, an increase, for, I think, from 78 to 84 percent for those who feel Chesterfield's a desirable place to work. The numbers were even better for, you know, in a variety of other factors. 94 percent feel Chesterfield's a safe community. Another 94 percent felt schools prepare their students for success beyond high school. 92, 90 percent for folks who feel like it's a desirable place to live, a desirable place to raise children. How nice was it to read when that when that data came back uh, as, you know, to see how well, you know, your, dir your, your direct customers, as you, as you referred to them in the past, in, that residents see the county and, and, and have that experience. How nice was that? Uh, and, and how much, how validating was that for, for what the job that the county does? Well, well, I'll admit I was anxious of asking people <laughs> how they're doing during a pandemic. Right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, many of my peers uh, that we try and benchmark against across the country 
uh, postpone such surveys. Mm-hmm. And, and I just felt at some point in time, you, you just can't delay asking people how they're doing. Right. And, and that survey has a wealth and an array of questions, and the sample size is large enough to really uh, have the margin of errors be pretty low. So when the, when the results were coming in, and they were coming in as if it was pre-pandemic mm-hmm. uh, thoughts, or even better, as you referenced, mm-hmm. uh, then, you know, again, that is great. But right. going back to the Laurel's concept right. is, you know, we're not done. I mean, right. it, you know, part of the message is, and, and your podcast is a clear example. You know, we have to communicate out to people many things because sometimes people say no to a certain question because they're uninformed. Right. And, and nothing against them is that their primary news sources aren't local right. news sources. When I say local, I mean Chesterfield centric mm-hmm. news sources. And again, all we try and do is espouse certain facts uh, at those can tell that you know we don't necessarily get the TV coverage or mm-hmm. even media print of uh, Virginia type uh, media outlets that we used to. Right. And and again, I, 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 that's their business. But then it's our business of figuring out how to compensate how to, yeah, for it. Right. How to get to them. And and certainly there's a lot to tell. Right. I mean, you know, we've kind of reached the portion of the of the state of the county where it's not necessarily like you're, you're a proud parent. You know. Look at how you know well my children are doing. But look at the you know Money Magazine tabs Chesterfield as the 41st place to live in America. And I love this little uh, note that you mentioned that of all of the other 40 that were in that top, none of the others were 437 square miles. And it's a it's a significant feat to to be in that conversation and to 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 get there. Only four of them even have populations greater than 250. Um, which I thought was was two hundred fifty thousand. Two hundred fifty thousand. Sorry, not two hundred fifty <laughs> people. That would be a fairly small county. Um, but other so Forbes re- recognized Chesterfield among the, America's best, um, uh, obviously for um, you know a survey of eighty thousand uh, across twenty five different industry sectors, and then you had top workplaces in D and I. Um, in terms of you know uh, not just the services that that the that the county pr- can provide to its residents because of a workforce. That it that it employs and, and the job that it does, but then also too in terms of attracting you know good good workers you know for good jobs. How how important is that for the county that that those accolades come in and, and what do they mean to the, to the organization? Well, just as a side story and, and an antidote is um, we got some national recognition for our digital technology, mm-hmm. you know websites, the way that people can maneuver through it. And again, these are byproducts of who we are. We don't mm-hmm. fill out a lot of forms and applications right. for recognition. And uh, there was a person in California, Silicon Valley, who saw and read it in some national IST magazine okay. and said, you know, I'm going to I want to work for that locality. Huh. And so he applied for a job. And, you know, and again, he wanted to live in California until he could figure out how to move here. So right. we, we, I believe, uh, have finished up hiring him. That's great. And just working out a slow but sure process. But he is teleworking a little bit three hours behind the rest of us, but uh, <laughs> he is definitely teleworking right now. Some and, early mornings. <laughs> but those are the those are the things that we would never would have thought about, you know, 20 to 30 years right. ago, where there's such a national presence of right. us uh, for those that are interested in knowing more. Mm-hmm. And, and as you said, I mean, a lot of these awards uh, and criteria are things of just who we are. It's mm-hmm. our demographics. We can't manipulate it. We can't write nice stories or have nice pictures to create a marketing aspect right, for right. it. Uh, the ones that we do apply for that that involve some criteria base, you know, we're doing it as part of our profession. So each right. of our 25 sort of lines of service are part of a professional organization, and they mm-hmm. submit things up and through their their respective food chains. And right. and again, that the national and state awards of those just keep rolling in. And I get calls probably once a month from someone out of state who reads something about us. And as I mentioned, the state of county want to know what our secret sauce is. And <laughs> and as I joke, it, it's hard to have secret sauce when you're a public entity. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that uh, if you if you you know you look at all of the different things that you do and you want to do them better, um, you know if the, if there was a secret to it, you know everybody would have it, right? It, I think part of that is just having. Um, you know, having the the right people in the right places. And certainly as the county continues to grow, and that's something that has been, you know, kind of in place. I think there's a, we've added, what, 100,000 or so in the last 20 years. And so I think that there are challenges that come with, um, you know, with that kind of growth and continuing to have that same level of service for for residents to continue to be fiscally responsible and continuing, you know, to make sure that the that the situation continues to get better, even as the county grows, even as there are more services that are needed because there are more people to that need them. And I'm just curious, what are some of the challenges that come with that sort of ongoing growth that maybe, you know, 
our other peers in the Richmond area are not necessarily experiencing in the same sort of way. What what sort of challenges come with that? Well, there's an expectation when you get all these accolades. You know, people think it's Shangri La when they right. come here, and you know, and, and you know, they, they don't realize you actually have to pay to live here and things of that nature. But but having said that, you you have a couple of people who come from far away mm-hmm. who are used to a local service that was provided to them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'll still get the call once in a while. It's like. My, my trash is outside the house when you come by to pick it up. And then you have to have a long conversation about how that's really a privatized service in, in the county. Um, yeah. But but again, you also have that same conversation that your tax rate is otherwise lower right. than where you once came from, because right. that's how the conversation usually starts. Right. You have people who are coming out here for the traditional manners of, of schools. Mm-hmm. You know, that's when they have families, they just want to have a continuum of education, K mm-hmm. through 12, mm-hmm. with their family. Um, what we're having more so now, just as much as anything, is those same families are not just staying here. We're having the grandparents of other children who have moved here for right. business or other quality right. of life things who want to be closer to grandchildren. Right. You know, we're, we're becoming a retirement community without advertising in Florida. <laughs> so it, it's just there's something that's uh, mystical and magical about that. Yeah. And then the last one is, you know, that I'm really focused on. And I try and work with the schools is, you know, we graduate 5000 students a year. Mm-hmm. And, and again, I'm not utopian thinking that they have to stay here day one, the day they graduate high school. Right. But I like to think that we had an environment or quality of life for them to live, work, play, mm-hmm. learn, for them to come back to, whether mm-hmm. it's in one year, four years, five years, right. or 10 years. And, I, and I, I just came across someone last week who moved away 20 years ago and just felt like they, this is where they want to spend right. the rest of their life. And, and they, they went back they lived in five or six places and had the luxury of choosing. They said this was the place. Yeah, that's great. And I feel like as you you know as you look forward and you and you think about sort of the way that the county continues to grow, the way those services you know and the and that sort of benchmark and and understanding how to hit it, you know, part of that is modernization, right? We we look at ZOMOD, which is what we refer to as the the modernization of the zoning ordinance and kind of the way that um, you know there's a lot that you know you want to continue to look at and keep kind of. Um, you know, breathing new life into. And that's certainly an aspect. And obviously there's a renewed focus in the county and, and you touched on this in your state of the county address in terms of not just what's the right business decision for the county and, and, and for, you know, bringing in tax revenue and that kind of thing, but also in terms of the use of, you know, different properties and, and, and what does the county need for out of those properties? What's the right decision for the county? And there's a handful of those, you know, that have come up recently. Obviously, you know, Spring Rock Green, the Genito Road, Special Area Plan, Upper Magnolia is coming up for rezoning here soon. And I'm just curious, to, as we're wrapping up here, um, in terms of modernization, in terms of looking forward, how important are, are those decisions for the county and, and what do they really mean for the long term future of Chesterfield? Well, a lot of people always say, you know, you should prepare more, be proactive. And it's hard for government Mm -hmm. to be proactive. It wasn't designed to be that way. I mean, it hasn't been that way since the colonists showed up at Henricus (laughs) since, you know, 1607. And, and, you know, to their surprise, there was no road infrastructure then, you know, Mm -hmm. already built. So you're always in a catch up mode. You're Mm -hmm. always having to have a demand sometimes before the supply, because if I have to have the supply in front of the demand, I have to tax people inordinately today mm-hmm. to build something for tomorrow's people. Right. And that's a harder sell sometimes. Right. Not just as a, you know, a CPA, but also for an elected official. Absolutely. Uh, that I greatly respect. So what you gave examples were were certain things where we've had to be proactive. We've had to stick our toe in the water because the private manner in which those things otherwise would arise would not occur right, right. or would not occur to the satisfaction right. of those that are using it. Right. So whether it's a sports complex that needed our uh, you know, infusion of our ownership interest mm-hmm. to best position it, not just for tournaments, but for the people. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just five years ago or so that when that place was not used for tournaments, the, the gates were locked at River City Sports Plus. Right. You right. know, now it is a public park mm-hmm. that as a byproduct is also scheduled for tournaments. Right. The Spring Rock Green is following suit to what we did at Stonebridge. We're, we're owning dirt because mm-hmm. the private mechanisms that are out there, they need us to have something zoned properly and positioned properly and have some incentive deal, mm-hmm. which is really just more or less a portion of their incremental revenues that they would generate from the properties right. to pay off whatever we have offered up as far as infrastructure, right. the road, water, sewer, and lines. You know, the Stone Bridge is already uh, behind us. Uh, Meadowville Tech uh, Center Park mm-hmm. is also behind us as far as the, the business of us being proactive. So. Mm-hmm. What you hear with Spring Rock Green coming up now, what you hear with um, uh, Upper Magnolia coming on, is, is just our manner of just trying to be proactive mm-hmm. and creating a, a business opportunity. But then we step aside. We're not in the business itself right, of being right, the right, business. Right, right. It's, it's more about you know, making sure that the, 
that the that the that the uses and 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 sort of the future are in are in concert, right? Are in a line, and I think that sort of speaks to a lot of what you you talked about uh, in your state of the county, especially toward the end. You know about looking at all of the different projects, and again, folks out there, if you haven't given a look yet, you can check it out on our, our YouTube page. The entirety of his uh, state of the county address really did, I think, a great job, a comprehensive job of really looking at not just you know one you know project or this project, but so many of them and sort of the the way that they all sort of come together. But um, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking to us a little bit about it. Again, if folks want to check it out for in its entirety. Um, it's on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it for yourself. But Dr. Casey, thank you very much for joining us and uh, being our first show of 2022. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brad, and, and best of luck to you. And, and I have <laughs> you on my regular uh, Spotify rotation. Uh, well, that's that's good because I would I would hate that uh, <laughs> I would <laughs> I would hate if you didn't enjoy the show. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you do. <laughs> oh, so uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get out of here. You can follow us on social media. On Twitter, it's at Chesterfield VA. And on Instagram, it's Chesterfield Virginia, all one word. On Facebook, you can check us out on our podcast page. Just search Chesterfield Behind the Mic. Make sure to like that page so you can keep up with us as we go forward. Now, let me tell you about all the ways you can check us out. Again, you can watch us on our YouTube channel as well as on our website, Chesterfield.gov slash podcast. An audio-only version of the show is available there as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and a whole host of other services. You can also watch the podcast on WCCT Thursday through Sunday at 7 and on the weekends at noon. That's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. Lastly, you can check out chesterfield.gov slash connect with us for more ways to get in touch with us as well as to get more information for you. My thanks to Martin Stiff, my director, my executive producer, Susan Pollard, and all the good folks here at Communication Media for all they do, not just in 2021, but in 2022 as well. So again, for all of us here in Chesterfield, thank you very much for making us a part of your day. We'll see you again soon. Take good care.